Um, when I walked into um, the room this morning, uh, or rather this afternoon, I realized uh, the company that I was in, because I hadn't read the list of attendees before I arrived. And so uh, I begin by saying how humbled and honored I am to be among all of you this evening. It's so good to see so many familiar faces of people whose work I uh, have used in my own work and whose work I have uh, truly long admired. Um, so it's really a, a great privilege for me to, to speak to you this evening. Um, this meeting and this session, which addresses the state of education and the new human biotechnologies, I think they are extremely important. Indeed, they are critical to future public discourse on these technologies and their impact uh, on American and world societies. So I, I, I'm going to try to make a few points, but I don't think I have to belabor the point for this audience. It is not hyperbole to say that these new technologies and their implementation will fundamentally change how we think about what it means to be human in the 21st century. These technologies will realign relations between citizens, the state, public health, and medicine. And I say this because I believe that those of us who will be teaching, writing and speaking about these new technologies must take our work extremely seriously, precisely because so much is at stake. Now, I was asked to comment on a set of questions covering the following issues, and I'll try to do that uh, within the time I have allotted. And those questions were, how well are we educating students, scientists, and the general public concerning the social and political implications of these powerfully consequential technologies? Where are we failing, and where are we succeeding? Now, my specific work in, uh, is on the ways in which new genetic and genomic technologies use the concept of race to explain genetic differences and variation in disease among and between human populations. To explain where I think we are today, I want to tell you a bit about the freshman seminar that I teach at Harvard titled The Concept of Race in Science and Medicine in the U.S. Now the course explores the following questions. Where and how did the idea of race emerge in the West among natural philosophers and later scientists? Why did they evoke such a concept to address questions of human differences? How did scientific and medical concepts of race change over time? How did race concepts in these fields butt up against religious and socio-political concepts of race? In the US context, how was race deployed? Uh, are racial categories natural categories? How did biological notions of race enter into debates about slavery? And of course, as you can see, I have a lot of questions in this course. <laughs> What is the relationship between scientific debates about race and other debates about identity and citizenship in the larger US concept? And lastly, um, how do new ideas about genetic variation among and between human groups enlist or resist concepts of race today? So the text I use for the course is, is the reader I co-edited with Rebecca, Rebecca Hersick, which Judy just mentioned. This book is a, a, a reader of primary documents focusing on race and science and medicine and anthropology from the 17th century to the present. The book documents how distinctions between people have been generated in, through, and around the natural sciences. And it presents no singular claim about the role of race in scientific investigation. But instead, it illustrates multiple conflicting efforts to assess difference. In short, it is a book about unresolved intellectual and political debates. And our aim in the book was not to sort out the good science from the bad science, to unveil the myths of race at long last, but rather, we see the task of social scientists as somewhat more difficult than removing bias from an essentially apolitical, culturalist method of inquiry that we call science. Now, given the resurgence of studies of racial difference across burgeoning fields such as neuroscience and pharmacogenetics, we felt that a tactic of debunking scientific racism was insufficient to the demands of the present moment. So our goal is to turn students to particular sites in which human variation 
including relations of inequality, disenfranchise, dis disenfranchisement, and violence, has come to be incarnated in blood samples, hair sections, scales of color differences, and of course, DNA. So we approach science not as a single instrument or method that reveals or obscures the real truth about human differences, but instead, like race, as a profoundly heterogeneous array of practices. So the selections were chosen to show the countless ways in which specific categories of people have been brought into being through laborious acts of observation, quantification, and experimentation. So let me tell you a little, about, a little bit about what happened in the course. Now, during the first session of the course, I gave my students a news report about the program that was about to be introduced at the University of California, Berkeley. This was last fall, and I know that many people in the room know about this. The program called Bring Your Genes to Cal. Uh, many of you have written about it. Many of you know about it, more about it than I do. Uh, but let me just say, for those who don't know a, a little bit about it, the 5,500 incoming freshmen were asked to provide samples of their saliva in an experiment designed to bring the student body together. Uh, and as Pat Williams famously said in The Nation, uh, this was kind of a community building exercise that used to be one around novels like To Kill a Mockingbird. <laughs> but now it's like bring your spit, okay? <laughs> so according to reports, more than 700 students who responded had their DNA analyzed in a Berkeley lab, which looked for any genetic susceptibility to things like alcoholism, lactose intolerance, and other kinds of... of um, uh, disease-related issues. As you all know, the exercise provoked so much debate that it was shut down quite quickly. Uh, many of you may know about some of the fallout that happened afterwards, and we could talk about that later. So I was curious about how my students would react to the story. To my great surprise, they saw absolutely nothing wrong with the study. They found it difficult to understand why it had been shut down. It was just DNA, they said. And having students give their DNA to the university would almost surely be a good thing to advance the science of genetics. So I tried to hide my surprise, I hope successfully, uh, and ask them some questions uh, that you would all be familiar with. Who do they think own their DNA? What does genetic testing actually tell us? Did they understand how any genetic analysis was actually done or any sense of how results were interpreted? Could there be any negative consequences for students in the future for having given their DNA to the university? As we discussed various answers that were given, it was clear that students only understood genetics in the context of their advanced placement lab exercises and not in a broader social context. Genetic material was for them a simple commodity, much like blood, that was only being used to advance science and health. DNA fit very easily in that construct in their minds. The second surprising discussion we had on the first day of class was about the use of genetic ancestry testing. Here students were fascinated by the segment of the documentary Race, the Power of an Illusion, many people in the room are involved in that, which showed a diverse group of students analyzing their own DNA to deconstruct their views about their racial ancestry. Now, my students really enjoyed this section of the film I think they enjoyed it more than any other section of the film. And they were intrigued by the confounding results uh, that were presented. For example, there was one white student of uh, Russian Jewish ancestry who found he shared some ancestry with a student of Asian descent. Now, you have to understand the context in which this, I was showing this film. The students in my class were extraordinarily diverse. The white students were in the minority. The students of color ranged from those of African descent from all over the continent. There were students who were mixed race. There were students who claimed they were Polish and Eastern European, Asian, and those who were, called themselves uh, Caribbean. And while they used these categories, uh, they were very uncomfortable with their own self-definitions. But the real surprise to me is that I thought in fall of 2000, what was last fall, that these students would have had uh, a decade or so in the 21st century or more uh, where notions of race had become very different from what people of my generation believed uh, and maybe some of the other folks in this room. I'm not going to call up people who are old versus those who are young. Uh, 
But the surprise, I thought, we, I thought we were making some progress. I thought we were coming to a different place. And my students uh, quickly disabused me of my uh, complacent views. Uh, the surprise was that they could simultaneously hold contradictory notions of race and ancestry. Uh, they believed that race was real, as shown by the differences in their outward appearances, dis and despite the results of genetic tests. And for them, the visual trumped the genetics, which was, the genetics was viewed as an abstract, invisible thing. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen or heard similar reactions from your students. My students did not believe that genetics was meaningful, meaningful in ascertaining their ancestry in terms of difference or similarity, okay? And uh, subsequently, uh, I just uh, another note, is um, a company approached uh, some students at Harvard to uh, have a spit party. And the students were quite upset when I would not give my support uh, to the company to allow them to do the parties on, on campus because our, our, our IRB found that the uh, company's consent form was woefully, I mean, was extraordinarily complicated and no undergraduate could possibly have understood what they were doing by giving their, their, their uh, by participating in these spit parties. But the, under, the undergraduates uh, were disappointed and very upset with me. Uh, I think they focused more on the notion of the party than the spit. <laughs> because spit was meaningless, like DNA is meaningless. <coughs> now, of course, we can understand these reactions from my students on the first day of class uh, as simply a result of their lack of knowledge of genetics, science, and history, and I would agree with that assessment up to a point. <coughs> Yet these were very savvy students who were quite well educated um, and quite well read, uh, but it was clear they held common and popular views of genetics, genomics, and also of heredity, ancestry, and human variation that sits alongside a scientific view which they see as a robust set of facts which are uh, certain and uh, true, and there is no uncertainty. And they hold these views in a kind of unstable way. The most important and urgent challenge we face as social scientists and educators, I believe, is how to unpack and contextualize these multiple views of genetics, genomics, and science, and make them visible in the popular context. Now, I know my students can, and they have learned, and they now have a more sophisticated understanding of the science of genetics and genomics after taking my class. But I'm actually not sure that they have gained a deeper understanding um, about the basis of their views about human differences. Because I think it is our social narratives about the certainty of current genetic, genomic, and of course, uh, other biotechnology, bio, biotechnological information, these, this knowledge is interpolated into our current cultural and political narratives in ways that are incredibly complex. And my questions are, how do we teach students to unpack this complexity? Because I think this is the crux of the matter, not the basic knowledge of genetics or genomics or how new biotechnologies are coming into being, but how these things become interpre interpolated into profoundly complex social narratives, okay, that make it impossible for them to act as citizens in many of the ways that many of you in this room and I myself would like them to act. Um, and I think that also it's a, it's a question for us because often our approaches as social scientists are characterized as ideological rather than analytical. Uh, how do we get and push scientists to be transparent about the uncertainties in their work that they recognize while they at the same time must compete in an ever more challenging environment with ever more constrained resources, which demands that uncertainty in science be suppressed. So I think that the challenges before us are quite serious, that in the 21st century, young, highly intelligent students still do not understand the resonances, the importance, the in deep embeddedness of notions of human difference and notions of the body, notions of privacy, notions of ethics that we all are here to talk about. Um, this will require us to develop multiple strategies 
and campaigns to disrupt this complicated social narrative um, that gives scientific narratives so much power. And I think that is the work, because the work of debunking science is one part, the work of showing the sort of ethical lapses in the regulatory uh, strategies that people are now employing is another part of our work. There's a lot of pieces to our work. But this work of showing how and why we continue to produce uh, generations of students who somehow still think spit is just spit, DNA is just this abstract thing that doesn't really matter. How is it we can turn our attention to making it clear to them how much it matters? Thank you. Thank you.